Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Pavel Gavrikovsky, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, distance oracles and labeling schemes for planar graphs. Uh, so yeah, the talk is going to be 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, you have time for questions afterwards, but if there is something uh, urgent, uh, I think it's good to uh, ask during the talk. So yeah, without further ado, uh, thanks, Pavel, for coming, and the mic is yours. Okay, hello everyone. So thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for attending. I will talk about distance oracles and labeling schemes. Uh, I promised planar graphs. It will be well, mostly planar graphs. You will see what I mean. And it's a very high level overview. It's not going to be a very technical talk. Uh, feel free to ask me after the talk for the technical details. And it's based on multiple papers, uh, not only my papers. Um, and uh, my papers are together with many people, so it's joint work from Edward Blut, Fanning, that is Adam Populus, Alfred Friedman, Shai Moses, Pat Nicholson, Przemysl Poznanski, Oren Weimann, and Christian Wolfenstein. Okay, so what's the basic question that uh, I would like to consider? So let's think about a map, okay? So let's take Google Maps. And um, I, I work at the University of Wrocław, which is a city in Poland, but uh, currently I'm in Paris. So I had to move from Wrocław to Paris, right? So I, I ask Google Maps, what's the quickest way to um, do that? Let's say by car, because you don't want to fly for obvious reasons. Uh, so that's the quickest road is 13 hours by car. Mm. Okay, so this is the type of question that I would like to consider. So you have a map and I will define what I mean by map. Mm. And then you have a bunch of queries uh, in each query, you, uh, you specify two places in the map and you would like to find um, the cheapest or the shortest route. Okay, so this is the, the question. Um, and it's motivated by like real life uh, applications, <laughs> but what I'm going to show it's not really going to be directly applicable okay, to real life. Uh, so I, I will just do like an abstract version of this question in which we have a graph. Mm, and this question has been sent out for journal graphs, which is not what I want to talk about. There are many great papers for journal graphs, uh, but the, the thing is that um, there's not so much you can do for exact queries for journal graphs. Uh, you can allow some approximation, then it's a bit better, but I, I want exact queries. I really want the shortest, right? Uh, okay, so for general graphs, it's it's hard. Uh, so you could think what what is a what is a map, okay? And you, one of the possible answers could be that a map is a planar graph, uh, which is a graph that can be drawn in a plane so that the edges don't intersect. Mm, so here is an example of the graph, mm, and. Uh, mm, now the goal is to pre-process uh, such a. Planar graph on n nodes, um, each edge has a weight, um, and the, the weight doesn't really have to be a distance between the uh, points in the plane. I will talk about this a bit uh, later. So you should preprocess this graph for queries that compute distances between any two nodes. So you are given you know, Q and V, and let's say that this is the shortest path according to the um, length of the edges that I didn't draw because it would be a bit cluttered if I had done so. Mm -hmm. So we want to know the distance. And maybe we want to find the path itself on demand, although the path might consist of multiple edges, so it should be a separate group. Okay, uh, so um, I said planar graph, and because of the way I've drawn it in the, in the plane, you might think that those are really points in the plane and the, the edges are segments, uh, but I, I'm not really going to, to think about this like that. So all the algorithms that I'm going to present, I'm not going to show the details, but they can be all implemented by operating on something known as collateral embedding. Um, so there are no, no points, no coordinates. So such an embedding, intuitively speaking, is uh, just an orientation of edges um, incident to each node. So you have a node and you have all the edges around this node and there is like clockwise uh, orientation of those edges. And that's the only thing you need to implement all those algorithms. If you want to be more formal, there is a nice formal um, definition. Uh, so each edge consists of two darts in both directions, uh, and you have a permutation that reverses the dart, so, so it, it pairs them up. And then the another um, permutation uh, allows you to go around a node. Um, so it's really two permutations, and they define they define the whole embedding uh, without talking about points they play. And it can be proven that this is enough. Okay, um, 
so so we want to do a distance oracle for a planar graph on n nodes uh, and we know that such graphs are sparse the number of edges is of n so so n is really the only parameter in this game uh, we want to consider the space of the structure like the, the size of the structure how much information you, you, you have to process and the query time um, so the naive solution will be just to store the distances between each pair of nodes it's n squared in the space and the query is just constant time the other extreme is that you don't store anything while well, you store the graph but you don't store anything else and in the query time you compute shortest distances between uh, u and v this can be done even in uh, linear time you don't need log n like for general uh, sparse graphs uh, so this gives you some trade-off and then people thought uh, what else can be done uh, so those i'm not sure if you can see my mouse but those two uh, one axis is the space and the other is the time and it's in the logarithmic scale so one means uh, n and two means n squared mm. okay mm. so uh, those two points are the, the naive solutions that i have described and the first thing people did is to extend the the trade-off so to connect those two points with a segment and you have to think a little bit how to do this but this can be done so you can achieve any trade-off uh, time times space equal to n squared okay so those are the old results i, I don't remember they're used but they're quite old then there was a paper back of a current call and Rao, and they showed that um, you can use space n polylog so all tilde heights uh, a few polylogs and the query time would be all tilde square root of n okay so this small space on the, but the query time is non-trivial it's uh, much smaller than linear than, than scanning the whole graph and this has been extended uh, to connect with the with the with one of the points in a series of papers. Mm, so it was not immediate how to do this. Okay, so we have those two lines. Then in 2017, there was a paper by uh, Cohen Adat, uh, Adat and Wolf for Nielsen, and they show that actually you can do much better in some regime of the parameters. Um, so I mean they had a trade-off, but the interesting the interesting uh, point is that uh, they could design a structure with size n to 5 over 3 and the query time was logarithmic so some kind of search so tree or something like that. okay and then you can extend this um, to a trade-off with like um, known techniques okay so this showed that this trade-off is not, not you know, the best mm, okay but then what's the, what what it should be you know? so uh so we had a um, paper uh 2018 where we improved this result to space n to 1.5 and the query is this the same logarithm yeah so this is this this point um, and then it can be extended to a to a trade and i will talk a little bit what's the high level idea behind this solution and it builds on the previous solution which builds on some other paper so i'm going to show you what's what this uh, nice technique Okay, this was not the end of the story. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had another paper where we improved the space to n to one plus epsilon, uh, and the query time was I'm, I'm hiding some. Um, I mean, <laughs> the, the many logs, yeah, um, depend on epsilon. So essentially, it's it's this this uh, blue point. It's not exactly here, yeah, because the space is n to one plus epsilon, so it's not really n plus log. And there was one other paper later. I, I will talk about what, what has been done later, uh, in a few minutes. Okay. Mm. So uh, I will briefly discuss th this result. So for uh, from a space bound between n and n squared, we can construct an oracle of size s, uh, the query time being n to 1.5 over s times some log factors. And actually, the, the trade-off is, is not very hard once you do the case of s equal to 1.5. So I'm only going to do that. So I want space equal to, um, to 1.5, and the query is log n. Um, so similarly to the previous result, where the space was n to 5 over 3 by Cohen, Adat, and others, uh, we use uh, this nice technique introduced by Cabello in uh, so 2000, uh, I don't remember, 17 maybe. Mm, it's it's uh, Voronoi diagrams, but on planar graphs, so that's slightly different than the diagrams you might have seen in geometry where they're on the, on the plane. 
Okay, but before I move to that, I will show you the basic tool that's used again and again in all planar graphs. I, I think there is no planar graph algorithm without this tool. Uh, so maybe you have seen this uh, before, but if not, um, okay, so this is a planar graph, and uh, I need the notion of separators. So a separator is a small subset of nodes such that when you remove those nodes, you obtain a bunch of connected components. And the size of each component uh, drops by a constant factor. So let's say it's two thirds of, of n. So you remove a small subset of, of nodes, and then you have a bunch of uh, smaller graphs. And the, the multiple lemmas about uh, what you can guarantee in uh, separators, like the first one is it's on Tarjan, and then in that paper, it was just a subset of nodes of size root n, that there was no other guarantee. Uh, but usually it's better to use a, a more structured subset of nodes. And there's a lemma by Miller. He showed that there exists a Jordan curve separator of size uh, root n. And by Jordan curve, I just mean that it, it's a cycle uh, in a plane. I promise that I will not talk about plane, but now I'm talking about uh, planes. So you take an embedding of the graph and uh, you have a cycle. So it only uh, it doesn't intersect the edges except for the, for the nodes of the graph. And uh, the number of nodes is uh, all of root n. Okay, and uh, we have we have the cycle. It separates the graph into inside and outside. It's it's uh, it's best to think about the graph being embedded on a sphere. So inside and outside are really the same. Um, they're symmetric, and on both sides you have two thirds of n nodes. Okay, so this allows you to do some kind of divide and conquer. You find a separator, you you add something to it. And then you recurse inside, you recurse outside. And many algorithms um, use that. But what you do exactly depends on the specific situation. So I will try to show you what, what can be done specifically for distance groups. Okay, so this is the inside, uh, and this is the outside. And again, think about this uh, being embedded on a sphere, so they are really symmetric. Okay. Mm. So, um, Let's say that you want to build an exact distance oracle. Mm. So it's a data structure that should allow you to find the distance between each pair of nodes U and V. So find, find a separator, find a Jordan curve separator. Now we have inside and outside. Recursively build a exact distance oracle for the inside. Uh, so as long as the as both nodes U and V are inside, this should help you. Mm. As long as the path doesn't go outside. As long as the path stays fully inside, you can just query this recursive structure. Okay, if, if the path stays inside. Of course, you and V could be inside, but the path could go outside. And then we, we, we have to see what to do. I, I will have a, a figure in a minute. Uh, then do the same for the outside. And uh, if you and V are both outside and the shortest path from you to V uh, doesn't go inside, you can query recursively. Um, so really what remains to do Mm, is to build a structure uh, that will allow you to find the shortest path from U to V um, that visits at least one node of the separator. So but to quick, cross from... Mm -hmm. Quick question. So how easy is it to find this separator? Is, uh, linear is time. Going... Linear ah. time. I mean, the proof is very constructive. There are many proofs and them all, uh, all of them are constructive. Okay, thanks. You, basically, you run a shortest path algorithm and you traverse a tree. So it's, uh, it's not trivial, but it's uh, okay. Uh, so what remains to do is to add some information to the structure that allows you to find the shortest path uh, from U to V, assuming that it intersects the separator. So the only way to, to cross. So if U and V are on different sides, one is inside, other is outside. Uh, the shortest path must cross through one of the nodes of the separator by definition of inside and outside. It could be also the case that U and V are on the same side, uh, but the shortest path uh, goes uh, to the other side and then it returns. So we have to think about both cases. Okay, so here is an illustration. So U and V are on different sides of the separator. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that the, the metric space induced by the inside is not the same as the metric space of the whole uh, graph? Okay. Distances are different. Distances, distances are different. So I'm saying that this structure for the inside should only capture shortest paths that stay inside. Okay. Uh, all other shortest paths would go through one of the nodes of the separator, and I need to add uh, separate uh, um, separate information to, to find this. Okay. Thanks. 
uh, okay, so here is U and V and they're on the different sides of the separator. So then the shortest path must cross the separator somewhere. Um, so it looks um, like that. Um, and furthermore, the shortest path might cross multiple times. I mean, it's not really the case. It can, but it crosses once and you are done. It can go in and out multiple times. Well, root n times, actually. You can see that's at most root n times. It will not go for the same node twice, but it's not. Okay. Uh, so what, what, what I would like to find is to, um, is that the first node w uh, of the separator with the following property. Uh, the distance from u to v should be equal to the distance from u to w um, in the uh, in the whole graph plus the distance from v uh, from w to v inside so in other words i take the, the last crossing and uh, if it crosses it, there is the last crossing and then uh, the distance is equal to this uh, sum distance from u to v is, is equal to uh, the sum where w is the last node on the, the last node of the separator on the shortest path. Okay, uh, I don't know the shortest path. So, so what I'm going to do is to, uh, I will try to find w on the separator that minimizes this sum. Each w uh, gives me a path of this length from u, to, uh, from u to v. And I know that for the shortest path, I, I have w on the separator. Uh, such a distance. So if I find W minimizing the sum, I'm good check. And again, it's important that distance from U to W is in the whole graph because the path can cross multiple times. But the the path from V to uh, from W to V is in the inside. It, it, I, I will use this. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, what I want to do. So so I want to some mechanism for finding this W in uh, in constant time or log n time. This is the only thing I'm going to do. I will keep finding no, no that. Uh, okay, so think about the inside of the graph. So I'm, now I'm taking uh, the inside home. Mm. So note U is outside, it's somewhere far, far outside. Mm. And those colorful nodes are the nodes of the separator. So here I'm assuming that there are four nodes uh, on the separator. Uh, okay, uh, so node u has the shortest paths to all nodes of the separator in the whole graph. And this is what I've drawn here. So those paths correspond to a distance from u to the node of the separator in the whole graph. Uh, so this is what was, uh, this is this part from u to w. So now we don't know w, so we will think about all those paths to, to every node of the separator. Uh, okay, it will not be important how those paths look like, but I would like to have them in the, the figure. Um, okay, so I didn't say anything about the faces of the graph. I mean, uh, the faces could be very large. For technical reasons, I want each face to be of size three. Um, also the outside, the external face should be of size three. Okay, so again, I, I'm taking the inside of the graph, so not of, not of the separator on the on the external boundary. Uh, this is a planar graph. The, the size of each face could be large. In particular, the size of the outside face is maybe up to root n uh, because each node of the separator is there. I would like to triangulate everything to have faces of size three or at least constant size. So this is what I have done here. So essentially, I've added those. Uh, uh, edges inside and then also the edges outside. It's not very important how, how this has been done, but each node of the separator is, is still on the outside face. Uh, face. The outside face is not, not triangulated, uh, but all the all the nodes uh, incident to the outside face are not of the separator. Okay, mm, now for each node of the separator, I define its, uh, its weight. And the weight is the distance from u. So I have a fixed node u. This is all done for a fixed node u. So I have distances from u to all nodes of the separator. And this is how I'm defining weights of, of nodes of the separator. And now uh, I hope uh, you can see the, the colors here. Uh, now I'm defining a Voronoi diagram. So, so what is a Voronoi diagram in this case? So for, for each, uh, you run a shortest path computation for, for each node of the separator. 
but you take the weight of this note of the separator into the account. So the red region uh, are the nodes in, in the inside part, such that uh, the nearest site, I, I will call the nodes of the separator of the sites, so the nearest site is the, the red site. And this takes the weight of the site into the account. So it's not done the distance inside, it's the distance inside plus the, the weight of, of site. Okay, so the uh, this red region is, is all uh, consists of all nodes that the, they are in the red site region. And I'm doing it for each color. So it's a partition of all the nodes inside into, uh, into subsets. Uh, and in each subset, the nearest site is, is uh, one of the, uh, is the same. Okay, uh, this is really like additively, additively weighted uh, Voronoi diagram uh, in the plane, which is a normal concept, but it's done on a planar graph. Uh, so the distances are distances defined by the planar graph, not, not by distances in the plane. So, so, but essentially it's the same concept. Okay, uh, and then um, finding W, so what was W? W uh, should minimize distance from U to W in the whole graph, plus distance from W to V inside. Uh, but this is really exactly uh, equal to the weight of the red side plus the distance inside. Uh, so I should check uh, what is the region of V. Uh, those regions uh, are usually called cells. So I should locate the cell of V and this, this will be exactly uh, the cell of W. Okay, so, so this whole thing uh, reduces to point location query. Again, thinking about uh, plane and Voronoi diagrams, you would have cells in the plane and you choose a point and you want to find what's the cell of this point. Uh, so it's point location. Okay, but here it's a planar graph. So, so it's not so clear what are those cells. I mean, they're not really connected regions uh, in the plane. That, uh, so we have to think a little bit what they are. Um, okay. Um, so again, this is the same illustration. Um, so we have to think a little bit about the structure of the cells. And I don't want to define this formally, uh, but informally they're not crazy. Uh, so they're not, uh, they are connected. The, each of them is a connected uh, fragment of the graph. So I, I've drawn those red edges and those red edges are actually uh, edges in the shortest path trees. So we have a bunch of shortest path trees and uh, they cannot intersect. It's, it's a property of shortest path trees in the plane. So I, I don't want to define this formally because they're, they're, they're connected in, in, a, in a specific sense. Okay, so what we can do now is uh, we can use duality. Mm, so probably you all know the, what's primal and dual for planar graph. Uh, so we can look at uh, all, the, um, all the edges of the graph such that the endpoints of the edge are in different cells. Uh, and then we take duals of those edges. And this will be the, the blue edges. So those are uh, the blue edges are edges in the dual. So for example, uh, you can see that there's uh, red and, and yellow and uh, there are many nodes uh, with a neighbor in the, uh, many yellow node, nodes with the with a red um, neighbor. Then we create a, an edge in the, uh, in the dual. Okay, uh, this is not really like what I've drawn uh, because there is just one node on the outside. There's one node corresponding to, to the outside face. So all those um, blue points outside, it's, it's really the same node. Uh, but for technical reasons, it's, it's better to split it into multiple copies. And then when you do this, um, you can prove that the blue does uh, create a tree. There are no cycles. And informally, a cycle would mean that you have a region, a part of the graph uh, enclosed by the cycle, and those nodes inside the cycle cannot reach any site. They're, in, in, uh, they're not in any region. This is like informal justification for why this is a tree. Okay, so this uh, dual of the uh, Voronoi diagram has a very nice tree structure. Uh, so hopefully we can do something efficiently uh, with, with a tree. Mm. In particular, mm, when you think about this tree, it could have many edges. Uh, there is no guarantee. But the number of, of those blue nodes outside is bounded by the number of nodes of the separator. Um, because between each of, like if you look at the illustration, between each two of uh, them, you have a, a node of the separator. Again, this is not like well, maybe formal pro, but uh, the purpose of this session should be okay. Um, okay, so you can have many edges in, the, in this blue tree. 
but you have not so many leaves and therefore not so many nodes with degree larger than two. Okay, you can, you can have very long paths consisting of uh, sequences of edges and all the nodes have degree two uh, on, on this path. Uh, but the number of nodes with degree larger than uh, two, uh, where, where three edges join is just uh, at most bigger of the size of the separator, which is root n. So this is much smaller than a graph. So you have the big graph of size n, but this whole Voronoi diagram, its structure can be described in uh, all of root n space. Assuming that you can represent those long uh, long paths consisting of uh, edges with uh, with endpoints uh, having degree uh, two, so I want to take uh, this tree. I want to like contract those long paths to, to like a single edge, but with some kind of extra information, and then I can describe the shape of this Voronoi uh, diagram in uh, all of the size of the space, which is again much smaller than the size of the graph. And uh, over there you can see where the end one point five comes from. Because this is applied for each node u. For each node u, I'm applying this construction that I'm obtaining a separate Voronoi diagram described with a tree of size root n. So I have n nodes u on the outside, uh, and it's, it's being multiplied by root n. Of course, this is, not, this is not all the information. This needs to be done recursively, and, and then, so, so there are some complications, but this is just to give you uh, an idea where does the um, root n comes from. Okay, so now we have a tree. So what you can do with the tree? Uh, I want to do some kind of binary search on this tree to find the, the, the cell of B. And to do binary research on a tree, it's useful to use the notion of a centroid node, uh, probably have seen. So a centroid node is a node that when you remove this node U from the tree, you obtain a connected component of size at most two thirds of the size of the tree, which allows, to, again, to do some kind of dividend on the tree. And uh, such U always exists. Um, okay. Mm. So mm, let's apply this centroid decomposition on the on, the, on this dual uh, tree. Uh, and again, it's a tree where I have contracted long paths to single edges, uh, and I, I will have to mm, take care of that. So a centroid uh, will be uh, because I've triangulated all the uh, nodes in the dual have degree three. So this is what I, what I have triangulated. So this is a centroid node in, in the blue tree, and it has it has degree three. So those are its three adjacent edges, um, and uh, because there are three edges in the dual, um, then this uh, we call this phase a trichromatic phase. Uh, so each each node use uh, y zero, y one, and y two. They are closest to a different site. So u zero is uh, closest to this um, I don't know magenta site. U1 is nearest to the red side, and U2 is closest to the uh, yellow side. So then in the in the phase, you, we have, you have three regions, three cells competing with each other, and therefore these sides are in the dual, you have a node of the grid tree. Mm. And you have an extra, an extra side, uh, green side. OK, so take the shortest paths from the sides to those nodes, U1, uh, U0, U2. And uh, so I just extend them with the same color. Um, Okay. This is the same illustration. And let, let's say that uh, V is somewhere here. So intuitively, uh, now I would like to continue the search in one of the subtrees of, of this blue tree. So it's a tree. I have found a centroid node. Removing this centroid node leaves you with three connected components. So it's three smaller trees. Uh, and I would like to continue the search in one of those. And now uh, this requires like a, um, a proof, uh, but intuitively uh, I will give you the description of the algorithm. But I mean, the, the proof is uh, a bit more technical. Um, so first, look at all three sides that you have here. So as uh, the magenta, red, and, and yellow, um, and find the one that's nearest to node V. Um, this can be done by just storing distances um, for each uh, for each uh, side. To all nodes inside. You can assume that you have this information, it takes all the n to 1.5 uh, space to store all of it. So let's say that uh, SI1 uh, is the nearest, uh, it's maybe not consistent with my illustration, but anyway. Uh, and then it turns out uh, that the only thing you need to do is that you need to take this red path and you need to check whether V is on the left or on the right on this path. And this tells you which part of T minus U should continue uh, with. Okay, so so this needs to be proven, uh, but it's, uh, you have to do 
just two things. You, you need to find the nearest site of those, those three sites. And then there is a check, left, right check, uh, according to the uh, shortest paths. And now the, the, the trick is that those distance from the sites and the path don't depend on the weights um, of the sites, because you are looking at the inside and you have a shortest path from the site to somewhere inside. It doesn't depend on the, on the weight of the site. Uh, and the same for the, uh, so it's the same for the distance and the paths. So this can be stored just once for each node U. So you need to store some extra information, but you store just once. And for each U, you just store this compacted, uh, compacted tree. So, okay, it's not uh, very detailed, but hopefully it makes some sense. Uh, so then the only thing to do, you need to store the shortest path uh, tree, rooted at each node in, uh, in the separator. Uh, you store some pre-order numbers to allow for uh, checking left, right. Uh, and then it, this allows you to descend uh, recursively. At the very end of the process, you will have a single edge of this compacted tree. It could actually uh, consist of many edges in the dual because I have contracted, but um, it's an uh, edge in the dual, uh, in the contracted uh, dual. So it's uh, you have to you have just two sides that could be the answer. So you have in the very end you have to check two sides. Okay, so so that's really the whole algorithm. And then it needs to be analyzed. So the query time is log n because we descend down in this decomposition uh, of the essential uh, the decomposition. And the space is n to 1.5 because you store something for each node of the separator and it takes often in space to store the shortest path trees. Uh, and the same for the Voronoi diagrams, uh, but for different reasons. So for each node u, you store this compacted tree of size root n. Uh, so it's n to 1.5 for both pieces of information. So it's n to 1.5. Okay, uh, so that was the, the third step that I had to implement, this, which allows me to find shortest paths, assuming that they cross the separator. Uh, if they don't cross, I recurse inside and outside, so I have to write down the recursion for the running time, and uh, because it looks like that, there are no extra logs, the space, the space is n to 1.5, it's dominated by the topmost level. The query is log squared n though, because uh, you have this sent the, um, the separator decomposition, and then you have to query this uh, central decomposition. So there are two logs. You can kind of squeeze it to one log, but I don't want to get to that. Okay, so that was the, the um, end to 1.5 with log and uh, query time. And then we had a better implementation. Uh, so end to 1 plus epsilon space. Uh, and the trick was that because the Voronoi diagrams are so small, Mm, it's better to store it for the outside of the graph. So you cut the graph into small pieces and for each piece, uh, disjoint pieces, and for each disjoint piece, you store the diagram for the outside. So the diagrams are actually for non-disjoint parts of the graphs or the graph, but it's okay because they are so small. So this is just a, 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 the first trick. It's already enough to bring down the space to n to 4 by 3. And then this point location mechanism needs to be done recursively. So to uh, in each step, you you call uh, you find some distances recursive and again and again, and you control how many steps of the recursion you have. Hence, the uh, epsilon in the, the query time kind of come, comes to uh, the game. And even later, there was a paper by uh, uh, Long and uh, my team, and they had uh, two new trade-offs. I mean, we also had trade-offs, but they didn't have to write them. Uh, they had a more cleaner uh, explanation of the point location mechanism and better trade-offs. So you can check the paper. Okay, uh, so now I would like to briefly discuss a different model of computation. Maybe you have seen this, maybe not, but I, I, uh, it's, um, the same question can be posted this model. And there are some interesting aspects. Uh, so this model is called labeling schemes. Uh, it's like a distributed model of computation in which you assign a label to each node of the network. Um, the label is just a, a bit string. So, so you, ass you assign a bit string to each node of the network. And then you would like the labels to be chosen so that you can compute the distance between each pair of nodes using just the labels. So you don't care about, uh, you cannot access the whole graph. Each node receives some short bit string. And then based on the bit strings assigned to you and V, you should be able to compute the distance uh, from you to V. Okay, so it's uh, somehow you, have, you want to split the graph into, into pieces and assign each piece to some node that, um, so that you can compute the distance. And we mostly want to optimize the maximum length label over all nodes in some family of graphs. And maybe the time to compute the distance, but the time is here less important. It's most about distributing information. And this has been considered for many different classes of functions, not just distance. You can ask about um, JSAC, or maybe that's the most basic question in this model. 
And again, when you compute the distance from U to V using the labels, you don't know the graph. You just you just need you just know that those two labels have been assigned for two nodes of the same graph in your classes in your class of graphs, but you don't know which graph. Okay, and just to give you a toy example, uh, you can think about uh, family of all paths. Mm, so PN is a path of N. So then the, the label of a node could be just the position on the path, and that's it. And then from those two numbers, you compute the distance, and it's log n bits. And you can see that it's optimal because the labels need to be distinct. Okay, uh, more interestingly, you can think about cycles. Uh, and there's uh, already an uh, op I think it's still open, um, it's not known what's the best bound. Uh, so, what you could do for a cycle, uh, you could store the, the length of the cycle and the position of the cycle. And that's enough to compute the distance. So you get x and y, and you either go clockwise or counterclockwise. But if you know n and the positions, you can compute both quantities. But this is too log n. Okay, this is too log n. Uh, so it turns out that we can do this in 1.5 log n. Mm, I will not show you how, so it's a, it's a puzzle. Uh, if you like puzzles, uh, but the lower bound is four over three times log n. So it's quite a big gap between, uh, between this and that. Already for cycles. Uh, okay, I will briefly talk about uh, trees, uh, even though I promised paragraphs, uh, but maybe skipping some details. Um, so you could consider finding a labeling, labeling scheme for distance in trees. So you want to assign a label for each node of the tree uh, so that you can compute a distance. Uh, and uh, there was a lower bound of one over eight times log squared n uh, from 2001. Uh, and it has been uh, improved to one over four times log squared n. So in the labeling uh, problems, it's it's often about the constant. Uh, so that's why I wanted to show you the trees. So I want to get the constant to be because the functions are so small. You know, it's log n or log squared. So you start looking into into the um, what's the constant factor there. If the function is larger, probably don't care about the the constant so much. Okay. Uh, so. What you can do. So the naive solution for distance labeling on trees is to store distances to all nodes on the path to the root, uh, plus some information to compute the lowest common ancestor. Mm, so if you know that, you compute the distances. Uh, but this this is not great when the depth of the tree is large. Mm, fortunately, you can apply this trick known as heavy from decomposition. Um, probably have seen this. So intuitively, it, it allows you to construct a new tree of depth log n, and it still captures some information. Um, for the tree, and so maybe I will skip that. Uh, so this allows you to get the space to be uh, one over two log n uh, log squared n for trees uh, with the heavy path, uh, basically because you have log n heavy paths above you, and for each heavy path you need to store one number. So this will be log squared n. But we, when you analyze carefully what are those numbers, it turns out that they get smaller and smaller when you go uh, up. So you, you shape a factor of one over two, so it's from a paper by Alstrup and so Okay, uh, and now I want to make a, a question. Um, so some of the labeling schemes can be seen as a question of finding a universal graph. Uh, what I mean by universal graph, it means that you take your class of trees on end nodes and you want to find one big graph on one big tree where you can kind of embed each, each, of, the tree, uh, each of the trees in your family. So in this particular case, uh, we will be asking about an n universal tree so that for each node for each tree on n nodes you can find a subtree uh, of, of this big tree uh, which is isomorphic to, to your tree okay so you want to be, uh, find one big tree and for one tree on the nodes you should have a subtree of, of that's as isomorphic to, to your tree if you could do that uh, then the, you could uh, obtain a labeling scheme for for the nodes of your tree by just finding it in the big tree, like everyone knows the big tree, it's, it's agreed upon. For your tree, you find its isomorphic subtree of this big tree, which is known. And the label of each node, it uh, would be just the identity of its corresponding node in the big tree. Okay, and that would be enough uh, to find the distance because the distance in the small tree is the same as the distance in its isomorphic copy in the big tree. So the label is just ID in this big tree. So the labels will be of size log of the size of the big tree. So if you have a small big tree, you have a good labels. Maybe you have to add some padding, but I don't want to do that. And this notion of universal trees have, has been studied in like a few areas, and that's why I wanted to show you. 
Uh, so there is a little work by Gordon and Lipsch, it's from 68, and they, they had a construction of a uh, tree. Uh, when you take the logarithm of that, you will get uh, one, uh, one over two times log squared n. So it matches the, the other one obtained by having a decomposition. Uh, and it's known to be the best possible. There was a later paper by Chandra and Chris Smith. So uh, it means that with this approach, th there is no hope to beat one over two times log squared n because the smallest uh, big tree is of size, such size. Um, for some problems, there is an equivalency between labeling schemes and universal graphs. Like for adjacency, there is equivalence. So it's exactly the same. But here we have implication just in one direction. And I want to show that in the other direction, it's actually not true. So I think it's interesting. Uh, and I, let me just comment that um, there are different notions of universal graphs. And uh, some of them have been used in different areas. If any of you work on parity games or something similar, they, they have been also using uh, universal trees to, to, to obtain algorithms for parity games. And I think there are other applications. It's a nice alliance uh, concept. OK, uh, and I will just give you one minute uh, overview of what you can obtain a higher, uh, lower uh, upper band. Mm. So it turns out that the difficult instances look like that. I mean, it's just intuition. Those are those were used in the lower band. It, this has been, uh, needs to be generalized. But mm. so it's like a balanced tree. Mm. And then there are some, uh, some edges have lengths. So they're not all of the same length. So for example, here you have x1, and this edge is of length m minus x1. This x1 and this x1, and this repeats. So, so for each node, you have this parameter. And let's say that uh, you want to compute the distance. Uh, and let's say that the nodes are like you can see in the illustration. Um, so, say that you want to recover x1. We want the distance, but when you know x1, you really want the distance. Uh, so, now the trick is that um, the nodes don't need to know. Uh, don't need to be able to extract the value of x1 on their own. It's, you have two nodes that meet, and together they should be able to, to kind of extract x1. So what you can do is that you can take x1, it's a number of uh, length log m. You can chop it into lower and ha uh, higher half, and you append the lower half to the label of each node in the left subtree. And you append the other half to the label of each node in the right subtree. So then when you have a label of a node from the left subtree and a label of a node in the right subtree, together they know x1. Uh, I mean, none of them knows x1, but when they meet, they together know x1. Okay, so you, you can distribute this information. And this is repeated in this uh, tree on, on each level. So intuitively, this allows you to shrink the space by a factor of two, because you, you chop each, each number into two parts, and you assign one part to one subtree and the other part to the other subtree. Uh, okay, not all trees look like that. Not all trees are balanced like that. So, so you need to make uh, this a bit uh, more technical. In particular, it's not really a partition into two halves. It needs to be biased depending on what are the sizes of the tree. Um, so I don't want to talk about this. And now I want to spend the uh, last five minutes talking about paragraphs. Mm -hmm. So now the question is to... Uh, uh, design a distance labeling scheme for planning graph. Uh, so you have um, undirected and for the time being unweighted, I will tell you why unweighted uh, planning graph. Uh, you want to assign the label to each node and then from the labels of your view, you want to find the distance um, between those two nodes. Okay, why unweighted? Because for weighted, we know everything. Uh, the right bound is root n times log n uh, bits for each label. Um, and this is obtained by just applying separators from the upper bound side. You find the separator, you store the distances to all the nodes of the separator in log n uh, bits each, assuming that the distances are up to uh, n squared. Let's say that this is the case. Uh, and then the, there was also a large one that shows um, that this is the best you can do for, for weighted. But for unweighted, it's, uh, we don't know yet, so I want to show you what we don't know. I will, I'm not going to talk about query time. It can be, you can also plug in this Voronoi um, diagrams mechanism into that, but it gets a bit more technical. Okay, um, so what you can do? Uh, again, you can find a separator. Uh, for each node of the graph, you can store its distances to the nodes of the separator. And you recurse on both. Uh, you remove the separator, you recurse each component. And this is okay to retrieve the distance because when you have node U and V, uh, you look at the separator. Uh, for each node of the separator, you know its distance from U and from V. You sum them up 
uh, until it's the node of the separator that, such that the shortest path visits this node, you have the distance. Uh, if not, they need to be both inside or both outside. So you reverse. Mm, query time is large, but okay, we don't care at the moment. So now the size of each label. Uh, so each label consists really of root and uh, distances. So you have root n in the first step of the recursion. Then you go, uh, the node belongs to the inside or outside part. So you recurse there. So you have some constant times n as the size of the current graph and you take root, uh, root of that. And you repeat and repeat a geometric series. So it's root n distances overall for each node. If the graph is unweighted, the distances are up to n. Uh, so each distance is, uh, up to n, so you need to store root n numbers consisting of log n. So it's root n times log n. And now let me show you why how you can do shape the log n. So it shows that unweighted is easier than weighted. So we have a separation, a small separation, but it's a separation between those two cases. And we don't really have that in some other problems. Okay, so let's see that the, the graph is triangulated already. It doesn't have to be case, and uh, you cannot really triangulate by adding edges to very large weight. Which you can do in other cases because now the graph needs to be unweighted. But let's say you are lucky, the graph is unweighted. And now let's say that you have a cycle. Uh, the separator is a cycle. It has been found using this lemma by Miller, so it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. So now uh, in the label, you would like to encode the distances from node U to all nodes of the separator that belong to a cycle. So my claim is that you don't need to encode them one by one separately. You can store one distance to one node of the separator. Then you go to the next node on the cycle, and you know that each distance from your node differs by at most plus minus one because of the triangle inequality. So you, you have a fixed node u. Now you have a node v of the separator. And the distance is d. You consider the next node v prime of the separator. The distance from u to v prime uh, can differ by uh, plus minus one. Okay. So instead of storing each number separately, just store this, this difference in two bits. So uh, the, the size of the label will be all of L plus log n. So one distance and then this uh, set of differences. So you do like difference encoding of the set of distances. And I use the fact that it's unweighted so that I can bound the difference. Unweighted and undirected, I actually use both um, problems. Okay, so if the graph is triangulated, uh, you're in good shape. What if it isn't? Uh, well, we would like to triangulate, but usually you triangulate by putting edges of length infinity. They don't change shortest paths. And therefore, in the general awaited case, you can triangulate. Uh, but uh, here it's a bit more technical. Uh, so we cannot really triangulate by adding edges with infinity. So we put those gadgets, you can see them in the illustration. So the chosen so that they change the distances by they don't decrease the distances and there is some connection between distances in the original graph and the distance in the new graph. I don't want to go into that. Uh, there's a way to put those gadgets. And then uh, we find separators in this new graph and the distances are all, um, are not too too much different from the original ones. Okay, um, so essentially this allows you to apply this reasoning for triangulated graphs for an arbitrary graphs um, by triangulating um, properly. Okay, um, so this is for unweighted. Um, and uh, there's a lower band for weighted uh, from this paper. It's obtained by, uh, from grid graphs. And for weighted, it gives tight results. For unweighted, there is a gap. The, the lower band we have is n to one over three. And the upper bound is now uh, root n. So again, it's a quite large gap in the uh, upper and lower um, part. Um, and we had, a, we had a paper where we show that um, maybe there's a better lower band, but you need a significantly different mechanism for showing this lower band. So what they did in the, in the lower band, they showed uh, that when you choose k nodes, um, together they need to encode a lot of information. So that, uh, that was like the gist of this argument. So it's like information theoretical argument. And actually it's not a labeling schema argument, it's, it applies to a data structure. So we show that if you have an unweighted and a graph on nodes, and you choose k nodes, then you can encode various distances between those nodes in uh, such space. So k squared is a trivial bound, but there is this root n k times n. Uh, and then it's, uh, when you play with those parameters, it will tell you that using the same proof technique, you cannot get a uh, large band higher than n to one over three. So I don't want to go for those calculations, but they're not very hard 
Um, okay, uh, and the idea in this encoding, so it's an encoding for the metric defined by those distinguished nodes. And the main property is something known as the Monge property, um, which is that when you have nodes on the outside and you have two shortest paths and uh, they cross like that, then you can write down the triangle inequality. So when you write down distances between every node on the left and every node on the right, you have this big matrix. You apply the triangle inequality, you get uh, this inequality. And additionally, when the graph is unweighted, then the um, adjacent entries in the matrix don't differ by too much, uh, as I showed you before. And then it means that this matrix can be compressed uh, to just x plus y, uh, total x plus y bits, where x and y are how many nodes we have on both sides. Uh, and then we have to apply this request many times. Uh, okay, uh, so let me just show you two open questions. Um, one of them is for planar distance oracles, we are still very far from understanding this. Uh, it would be nice to have like n pole log space and pole log uh, query with as many pole logs as you wish. Uh, we don't care as long as it's uh, ended to one. And then I didn't go through the details of this uh, live band for um, lab labeling, uh, but we need like a different proof technique. Uh, the, the, the only one that we have. It's that the actual doesn't use the distributed aspect of this whole thing. It, it takes, it chooses some labels, it concatenates them, and it argues about the total length, which is maybe not what you want to do. Or maybe you have to apply it more carefully. It's also possible, but we are not sure. Okay, so that's all I have. And thanks for listening.